Future Leader uh, Panel with the Global Challenge students at the Stockholm School of Economics. Let me next invite Professor Sarah Jake, uh, Jack and Dr. Margot Enthoven, who will be moderating this panel. Sarah Jack is the Jacob and Marcus Wallenberry Professor of Innovative and Sustainable Business Management Development. She also leads a platform with the Mistra Center for Sustainable Markets at SSE. Sarah works on sustainable issues connected to entrepreneurship and innovation, especially social sustainability, and she is the course director for the bachelor course on social innovation and global challenges. Dr. Margot Enthoven is a researcher at the House of Innovation, working on sustainability and entrepreneurship and innovation. And she also teaches on the bachelor's course on social innovation for global challenges. So thank you, Randula, for that kind introduction. And thank you to Len and the organizers for, for inviting us to be part of today. So what I'm going to do is briefly talk through a new course which has been developed at SSE in response to the global challenges we are experiencing today. And so this year saw the introduction of a new global challenges course titled Social Innovation for Global Challenges. And this course was designed to provide students with an understanding of social innovation in the context of some of the global challenges that we're experiencing today and that we're facing today. And students were introduced to tools to use to address societal problems through business and other types of organisations as a way to really kind of enhance their understanding. And in addition to learning how to generate and evaluate potential innovative venture ideas to address global challenges, students also learned how to holistically and critically evaluate social needs and develop plans for action that have a large potential impact on sustainability. So throughout the course, students were introduced to entrepreneurship, corporate entrepreneurship, nonprofit solutions and political action. And the course included concepts such as social change, social innovation and social entrepreneurship, but also covered key elements of external and internal stakeholders, how to deal with the resources, impact and impact measurement, sustainable business models for value creation, change-making strategies, and systems thinking. But it also elaborated on the potential negative external effects of social innovation. So, for example, the dark side of social innovation, which we don't always really kind of speak about. So the course was very much about trying to appreciate social innovation in the context of society, the global challenges we face, and societal benefits. And to kick the course off, we started with a climate change game which saw the students move to map out over three hours the implications and outcomes of climate change. A bit of a wake-up call for many of us, emotional, especially in terms of the risks that we're all facing. And the course ended with a group presentation supported by a poster and social innovation prototype. And it's these posters that are, will be available in the aula, which you'll be able to see um, outside of this room sorry, today. So student ideas dealt with poverty, homelessness, social enterprises and lack of skills, education and gang crime. And in the context of Sweden, but also further away in contexts such as India and Africa. And it also gave us the opportunity to link interdisciplinary research projects to the class content. So students were very much introduced to very current and critical dimensions, such as COVID-19 and entrepreneurship, and how this has really helped to bring to the fore sustainability as a critical issue. Social innovation in marginalised and rural areas and some of the cases developed through an EU Horizon 2020 project with 27 partners from across Europe. Public procurement of functions in the circular economy of sustainability from an MMW project that's being carried out in Sweden uh, with Misam and Mr Rees based at Linköping University. And gender and equality issues through an EU Horizon 2020 project on building transparent and resilient gender equality through integrated monitoring, planning and implementation. And also water issues in Africa through a global challenge project that's been that we've been working on across Africa and how collabor through collaboration we can build a better place, which has been some of the things that's mentioned today as well. But what I'd like to do now is really turn to our panel. And for this panel, I'm joined by Margot. And Margot Enthoven is a researcher at the House of Innovation working on sustainability and entrepreneurship and innovation, and a co-teacher on the bachelor course, which I've just talked about. And Margot and I are also really delighted to be joined by some of the future leaders from SSE. So for this, this panel, we, we especially invite our future leaders to offer their perspective on sustainability and seek their views on how we might work together to build a better future for all. 
So our future leaders are students who are engaged in undergraduate and master level programmes at SSE, and I'd like you all to, to come and join me now. So we're delighted to be joined by Aidan, by David, by Emma, Marcus and Sasha. We would also like to thank Abu Bakr Ali for all his help with the planning for today. Unfortunately, between lectures and other commitments, he can't join us, but he's very much a part of the planning process for this, this event. So thank you all for giving your time today to join us. And I know that you've come between lectures and other commitments as well. So thank you for that. But to get us started, I'm going to ask a fairly open question. Everyone, can you briefly introduce yourself and say what sparked your interest in sustainability and sustainable development? Aidan, will we start with you and just work our way along? Yeah, um, so I'm Aidan. Uh, I've come from, you say, across the pond, um, AKA the Caribbean, so very different environment. And um, yeah, I grew up in a country that was plagued by a lot of social problems, a lot of uh, institutional Corruption, um, control by uh, corporate, mega corporations, um, oil companies primarily. Um, and I saw the direct effects, effects of uh, climate change and uh, social issues uh, in my daily life and growing up. And therefore I realized, okay, I want to do something about this in life. Uh, feels only right for me to do so because it's everything that I think everyone deserves. Um, so that's what brought me actually to Sweden and what brought me to sustainability, what brought me to this course as well. Thank yeah. you. Sasha? Yes. Um, so my name is Sasha. I'm Cypriot American, um, also coming from an island country that's currently under occupation. Um, climate issues are particularly challenging because we're held responsible for both sides of the country, even though only being able to apply governance to the southern half. And additionally, growing up in the Midwest of the United States, I've been surrounded by agriculture all my life, and I've become particularly passionate about issues uh, pertaining to agriculture, watching farmers suffering in the United States, States which led to me starting a company um, on sustainable agriculture and eventually also moving to Sweden. David? Good. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David. I'm from Switzerland. And I'm a second year master's student here in the master's program in economics, and I'm also one of this year's Wallenberg Fellows. Um, I think the introductory question is very interesting because uh, I think a lot of young people kind of would answer with a counter question, like how can you not be interested in sustainability, given that it's kind of the defining challenge of our generation? Um, so for me, it's kind of clear why I want to be involved in this and why I want to work on these issues. Thank you. Marcus? Yeah, my name is Marcus. I am... Uh, uh, not like the not like the rest of you. I'm from Sweden, uh, second year bachelor student here. I've been involved together also with some of you in the school's effective altruism organization, and I'm now also enrolled in the school's uh, civica or civil engagement program. Uh, I think my interest for, sustain for sustainability comes a lot here from Sweden and being close to Swedish nature. Uh, I've family from Norrland, so I've been able to spend a lot of my holidays up seeing Swedish nature, its beauty, but also how easily the ecosystems get uh, disrupted by human activity. So for me, what really sparked my interest was the will and like the need to protect this beauty of nature and protect the ecosystem that we have. Emma. Yes, um, my name's Emma and I'm a first year bachelor student here. I'm Swedish and British Caribbean, um, and I'm, but I'm also what you'd call a third culture kid. And I've been very lucky to live in six different countries, so Sweden, Lebanon, China, the US, Kenya and the Netherlands. It's a long list, but it's been very exciting. But of course, through that, I've been exposed to a lot of different socio-economic co contexts, as I think I wrote in my application to SSE. And through that, I think there's an oncoming wave of change that, as has been said, you cannot avoid. And the reason I was interested in sustainability, I think, is because it's at the forefront of this change. And humbly, I'd wish to be a part of that and learn more about it. So, yeah. Thank you all. And I'm now going to turn to Aidan, because you were engaged with the Social Innovations for Global Challenges course. And uh, can you just sh share with us the, the social innovation idea that you came up with? in your group and what really kind of drove your idea there? What was the social problem in the SDG that you dealt with? Yeah, uh, I guess I give my pitch. Um, so basically throughout the course, me and my uh, brilliant group 
uh, found out that uh, last year in 2021, uh, 19 out of 23 regions in Sweden were understaffed in the healthcare field, um, especially in hospitals and especially during uh, summer months. And uh, we saw that going into a bigger problem of the healthcare system being basically uh, has a lot of pressure on it um, from a staffing side of things. Uh, and not necessarily for specialists or for um, very critical roles, but more for administrative tasks, for simpler roles, for things that everyone has to do, but there realistically was not enough people to do it. That was especially relevant in uh, COVID-19, the height of COVID-19, um, when they actually had to introduce students uh, from medical schools to help with administrative tasks. And we basically thought, well, why don't we make use of that. Why don't we think about medical students actually gaining more access to the workplace, seeing the actual processes that go on, getting the opportunity to actually make an impact and actually feel a lot of motivation for the thing that they're studying. Um, and so our uh, social innovation was basically a platform that allowed medical students to connect with the institutions and medical professionals where they can actually get access to help with these sort of tasks and to learn about the medical field, but as well as alleviating some of the pressures from the administrative tasks that uh, currently uh, hinder or bottleneck some processes in uh, medical institutions. Um, yeah. It brought together all of that, didn't it, really? It was uh, yeah, very interesting and very current, but also the, the digitalization which was kicking in was, was good as well. Margot, I don't know, do you want to... Thank you. I think it's interesting that uh, you created something that brought together uh, a couple of actors uh, because I think that is one very important thing about these uh, global challenges. Uh, who are we going to uh, turn to and who are we going to ask to collaborate? And I want to turn to David with a question uh, about that. Um, so who do you think we need to bring to the table to kind of make this change happen? Um, I think the short answer is everyone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the complexity of the issue uh, with the climate challenge really requires everyone to work together. And I'm specifically thinking about uh, an increased cooperation between the public and the private sector. Um, I think it has been said before, uh, I think, in my opinion, technology is really one of our best shots at this uh, challenge. And we need the private sector and we need companies and entrepreneurs to drive this innovation and, and, and develop these new technologies. And for these companies to be able to do this, I think we also need the financial industry to provide the capital to, for the companies to be able to research this. Um, but then I think one thing that should not be forgotten, and I, it has been said today, um, I was a bit surprised, pleasantly surprised about this, that actually, yeah, the public sector is also very important for setting kind of this uh, policy framework in the future that gives companies the security to invest in these technologies, knowing that, well, in the future, there will be a demand for sustainable products um, and make it attractive. Now, a last thing that I also think is important to keep in mind is like global, um, climate change is a global challenge. So even if we solve it here in Sweden or in Europe, if other countries do not uh, contribute, it doesn't help us a lot. So I think also we should look at diplomacy and the means of diplomacy in solving this challenge. But then also to make the bridge back to the private sector, companies are acting globally and they can also contribute to solve this issue in other countries and act in this way as, uh, let's call it corporate diplomats to help solve this problem. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you. So basically, a lot of collaboration. Everyone <laughs> yes. needs to be involved, but some specific things in there as well. So I think that's uh, that's good. Um, and I, I want to turn to to Emma now. Um, so Emma, are there any current initiatives that you can think of or that you are engaging with that are helping this agenda forward, and how? Um, well, I've only been at SSC for eight months now, so I haven't gotten the chance to dip my toes in all of these interesting things in the courses that are happening. But as a matter of fact, we are currently in the Focus CSR Week 2022, which I'm the project leader of. And the goal of that basically is to have actors from all these different industries, which you mentioned that we need to have collaborating, come to the school and talk to students about what's happening in all these industries, what are the top issues and how they took, what steps they took 
within their careers from school to where they are now so that students can also see that you don't have to be an environmental or social warrior just tweeting every day or looking on social media and speaking your voice and g giving your opinion to actually be making a difference. That there is a career that you can make out of it and that there are industries out there that want your help in making a change. So that's what we're doing right now, actually. Thank you. And, um, I, I think that's a very interesting challenge there because I feel like a lot of uh, young people exposed here uh, in, in the climate um, crisis and in the SDGs are often activists. But I think it's, as you said, very important to show young people the range of activities that you can do. And uh, Marcus, um, what is your view on this? Well, I, who have now been one extra year here at SSE, and uh, been able to see more of what everything the school is doing. I think one of the greatest initiatives that, uh, that has been taken for the past year has been the school's civic initiative, which I mentioned a little bit before, which basically is an ini initiative where uh, there's a big collaboration between some of the leading schools of social scientists in Europe uh, that basically offers students an opportunity to heighten their commitment to civic engagement through different engagement courses, interaction with, uh, uh, with community organizers, and also a thing called European Week, where we get together uh, from students from all across Europe and practically work on some of these social issues. And I think engagement like this, both uh, both this wider one, which is school, which the school does to actually gives the opportunity to students to practically work on this on these projects, and also encourage this international collaboration between students, uh, is some of those that really will drive the agenda forward. But also, well, as we, but also those initiatives that we do here with Focus are, which uh, I'll be participating in tomorrow. Also, I think, well, I think those initiatives are really the ones that. Uh, put for uh, drive the agenda to the next level. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. So, um, Sarah, I want to hand it back to you. So, uh, Sasha and Aidan, I'm, I'm going to come, come to you now as well. So, how can future leaders sell their ideas and initiatives for change for sustainability? What's your kind of views here? We'll start with you, Sasha. Yeah, um, so I guess this is something that I've learned about uh, through a lot of failure. Um, when I was working on launching my company, uh, one of the biggest challenges was raising capital for a heavy machinery uh, system that I was building. We needed 50,000 US dollars before we could actually launch the idea that we had. It's quite difficult to present those ideas because we were presenting a concept that would basically change how the food system within our county in the US would work. Um, so it took a lot of storytelling and communication within that community to sort of convince them of the value that we could create. Um, because when you're asking people within a society to change, they need to know what's in it for them. It doesn't matter what's in it for the world. It doesn't matter what's in it for the environment. People are very uh, focused on themselves. So it took a lot of um, trial and error to figure out how I could develop the stories um, for them. And I think for uh, policy, as well as innovation, this is something that we're going to have to continue working on. Thank you, and Aidan? Yeah, and I'd uh, add on that by um, emphasizing the fact that, yeah, humans are naturally selfish, um, and we need to acknowledge that to some extent. Uh, when coming up with um, social innovation, with coming up with new ideas, when trying to present them, not in that we should treat people badly or say like, oh, you're bad for being selfish because we all are, uh, and it's more that we all have needs and we all have wants and we all have a way of life that we're used to living. And if we want to introduce change, it needs to be of benefit. It shouldn't be another choice. It shouldn't be uh, another niche. It should be something natural. When I go to the supermarket, I shouldn't have to feel bad about buying one thing or the other. I should feel like this is just the way I live. and. Know, the ideas that we come up with should really respect that fact and make it easy for people in a way. Um, and that's mostly through communication, I think, as you said. So as we're moving to the end of the panel, and I want to leave some time for, for questions from the audience for the, for the students as well, we, we want to kind of take a perspective on the future as well and hear how you view the future. So you're the future. 
And as our future leaders, what are your views on change and what, in your view, should our priorities be? And we'll offer that as an open question. Uh, starting with that, just taking a little bit of a, well, economics perspective from what I've learned here. I, uh, you can't really expect people to actually care about sustainability if they don't have, if they don't have the short-term uh, life quality secured. So I think if we, really want, if, you, if we really want to have a global collaboration around this, if we really want everybody in the world to start working towards sustain, uh, sustainability issues and taking them seriously, we have to first secure that each individual, each country actually have the baseline life quality needed to have this focus. So whatever is the most efficient way to start improving life quality, uh, both for people in uh, more developed countries that may that maybe face instability with job loss and unemployment, and in more well developing countries who face well starvation and the risk of uh, and the risk of climate disaster. I think starting start, starting with starting with getting those kind of like baseline issues solved, so that every so we can get the global cooperation around sustainability is well de definitely first priority we have to take. Anybody else, Emma? I think just to add on to that, I think in order for us to even like start pushing forward that agenda, even though it is quite, it's we've been moving forward, and I think our generation, thankfully, is aware of a lot of issues, and that's in great thanks to the abundance of social media that we have access to. But for me, oftentimes the priority is communication in order to facilitate collaboration and healthy communication, because I think as almost like um, what's it called illustrated here tonight we have a lot of people agreeing on things but almost sometimes it feels like you're talking over just missing people or just missing the point and of course I think that's only going to be emphasized if we keep being limited to the trendiest video on TikTok or 150 characters on Twitter you know obviously there are wonderful places for issues to come to light and to be start trending but I think within schools like we have here as I see through our reflection series and within classrooms healthy discussion and encouraging people to express their views and ideas and then co constructive collaboration. Some way to facilitate that, I think, would be the most important thing for me because I think when we're discussing these issues, we're all asking why isn't anything being done? And I think as soon as we can have people illustrating in a clear and concise way why they should be done, I think the work's going to be a lot easier. Yeah. Aiden, yeah, and I, Aiden. I can uh, add to that a little bit that uh, yeah, you're saying it's not really a targeted incentive in a way to a certain audience of people. Um, this is for everyone and by everyone. Uh, and so uh, in terms of priorities, it's really making sure that there is this continuous learning cycle. There is this way of everyone understanding that this isn't just uh, another marketing campaign. It's not just another thing for them to think about. It's part of their life. It's the change that we're going through as a society. Um, yeah. Okay, Sasha. Um, I think that these are all excellent points. Um, I guess one strong action that we should be focusing on taking is divesting from fossil fuels. And we have to do that quickly. Um, we're on limited time, and I think that we need to start in the global north, and we can't rely on the global south to be taking those steps, because um, we've talked about people in the global south need to focus first on the ability to survive, and right now they're suffering because of uh, the carbon dioxide that we're already emitting up here. And David? Yeah, I totally agree with everything that has been said so far, and I would like to uh, continue on a point that you just raised with fossil fuels. Um, as part of my master thesis that I'm currently writing, I, uh, I'm researching or I'm doing research on fossil fuel subsidies. And uh, I was very surprised when I started this research because I thought like, yeah, well, everyone agrees kind of that we should tax them, I think, to internalize the externalities. And I was very surprised to hear that we're still like subsidizing them every year with 450 billion US dollars. So uh, this is, I think, an issue that also has to be worked on because I think, um, yeah, paying people to burn fossil fuels is not going to solve this crisis. So, yeah. Thank you. I've got lots more questions, but I'm <laughs> conscious of time and that we're, we're, we're ticking on now. Um, so what I'd really like to do is take some, some time to, to invite questions from the audience for our future leaders. I think we've got a mic going around somewhere as well. Oh, Margot's got the mic. Over here. 
sorry that I have to ask another question, but I, I really appreciate your passion and the way that you are developing your minds. Uh, but I'd like to go back 100 years ago, before any of us were born, before the industrialization of Sweden. Uh, Sweden industrialized quite heavily from an agrarian society. 80% of people used to live on the land, uh, and now 80% of people live in cities. Um, but you were talking about changing perceptions. How do you think that's done most effectively um, if you are the business owners of the industrial world? You know, we have families that have owned oil companies. They have now transitioned into electrified or renewable energy companies. Um, how would you change people's perception? Would you invest in uh, funding educational programs? Would you look at uh, influencing the media? Uh, what type of techniques would you use to change people's minds to get them to agree with you? Because clearly, your minds have been changed over time, and you now believe passionately that you know, carbon dioxide is the main issue we have in society. Uh, I just thought it was quite interesting because everyone talked about technology, um, where does nature feature in this, or living things? Uh, it almost feels like we need C-E-S-N-G. Carbon, or climate, environment, biosphere, social prosperity and human happiness, and then, you know, avoiding corruption and governance. Happy for anyone to give a view. Oh, Marcus. Yeah. Well, uh I could start with uh, the well, changing perspective uh, side. Uh, if you think, uh, if you start thinking about it as we uh, we will be the new consumer, we will be the new business leader, etc. None of us will really be interested in investing money, spending mo uh, on products or in companies that we know actively will do us harm, that are destroying the future of the planet uh, and our future. So I would probably say the most well efficient way to uh, affect people's uh, perception, especially in the business world, will be to well make that clear. We will not be interested in buying products from companies that are destroying our future. We will not be willing to invest in this product in these companies and also from like a pure business perspective well a co yeah a company a company in my mind that is destroying the world and destroying my future that is a lousy investment for me to make so well I, w I would say that kind of argumentation making that clear for businesses in the future yeah and then uh, if I can address the other thing of uh, going back a hundred years ago um, I think it was more than 100 years ago now that the electric car was first invented. Uh, in fact, it came, uh, it was popularized before uh, gas powered vehicles um, as a mode of transport for city dwellers, especially. The problem came when the um, gas powered vehicle companies decided that it was uh, a great lifestyle choice to have a gas vehicle. It was more, uh, at the time, it was more manly, it was more interesting, it was more uh, mechanically unique. Um, and they sold that lifestyle. And over time, everyone agreed to it because it benefited their needs uh, and it became comfortable. It got a lot of investment uh, and so forth and so on. And now we are where we are today. Uh, and in the same way now, when it comes to new technologies, when it comes to new changes, when it comes to thinking about uh, what people appreciate and what they want, it is very much addressing the fact of people have lifestyles that they want to live, uh, people have needs and they have wants. Uh, and if you want to sell them an idea, you have to get them to appreciate what that idea can actually bring. So if, for example, if it is nature that we're talking about, if it is everything around that, the fact that we have so many documentaries now that highlight these sort of things. I think it started in the 70s as a big movement of documentaries really highlighting the natural uh, planet and that led to a lot of climate driven initiatives. Uh, and so the same thing happens now. It's just uh, a cycle that continues and we need to be able to 
incentivize people to appreciate the things that uh, we need to do. Maybe I can also just very quickly, I think one can learn a lot from looking back in history. I think it's always a good thing to do, but we also have to look forward and see the realities today and think where do we want to go from here? And uh, I think this is the important question in this sense. I think we're, I'm sorry, I, I, yeah, I'm being told time, time, but maybe that's something you can follow up afterwards in a discussion. Okay. Okay, well, thank you all very much. Thank you for your questions as well.